Yeah, as, as I said, CRISPR-Cas9 is about uh, actually mobile genetic elements in bacteria and, and to understand mobile genetic elements, it's uh, helpful to be mobile yourself as a big human uh, mobile genetic element. Um, so I will, uh, so <laughs> thank you Jennifer for giving some introduction about uh, CRISPR-Cas systems. And yeah, before I start, I would like actually to thank the, the foundation uh, and uh, Bengt and, and the Academy, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences for hosting this event. I think it's uh, essential in our days to provide awareness on chemistry, science, biology for the young audience like you. Uh, so I will speak about uh, CRISPR-Cas9 in general and also uh, the applications of uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Um, Okay, so this is, I just want to remind you that this is about uh, this enzyme, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, here represented as uh, scissors, uh, that can be programmed with uh, RNA molecules to uh, target, sequence specifically, uh, DNA. Uh, so the, the, the Cas9 protein works as, a, as an enzyme, able to, to cleave DNA in a sequence specific manner, and the RNA uh, components work as a kind of GPS system allowing to, to bring uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system uh, where one would like to, to have it uh, targeted on, on the genome of any cell and organism. So it's a very powerful technology. And indeed, among all the different CRISPR-Cas9 uh, existing, the CRISPR-Cas9 is, is quite minimal. And this was uh, a great uh, surprise to find that, that in Streptococcus pyogenes, but also in other bacterial species, the CRISPR-Cas9 is actually a unique enzyme guided by two RNA molecules that can form a complex. So, so the idea of, of using uh, this system uh, for genome engineering is really based on, on the simplicity of the system, yet, yet its uh, sophistication, allowing to have a, a simple uh, programmable uh, genome engineering technology. Uh, so the, the field CRISPR for uh, the application of the, of the technology uh, has been called the, the CRISPR craze, and uh, this was highlighted by uh, journalist Elizabeth Penisi in the journal Science in 2013, so summer 2013, nearly four years ago, and already highlighted as a CRISPR craze uh, with a subtitle, a bacterial immune system yields a potentially revolutionary genome editing technique, and this is really about this technology that allows precise gene surgery and in a cell and organism and this article was published only a year after uh, we published with Jennifer Dana uh, the, the article in, in Science, uh, so in, in June 2012, explaining the last step of, of the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism and how to harness uh, this mechanism how, uh, as a powerful uh, technology for, for genetics. So this shows uh, to, to which extent, indeed, the, the, the mechanism was easy to adopt by the scientific community, and that shows very fast... Uh, the, the, the possibility to really use this technology to, to perform genome engineering in a, in a large variety of cells and organisms and virtually any cell and organism which, which a biologist can ethically uh, study. And very fast as well, uh, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 field has been the highlight of, of the media, uh, first as the next uh, medical breakthrough, uh, but then recognizing as well the potential of, of the technology in diverse field of, fields of, of life sciences and and agriculture was, was mentioned by uh, Jennifer Dana earlier. And surely a number of scientific journals have uh, published on, on the follow-up of understanding uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism, trying to, to develop better the technology and all kinds of, of applications. So this has really been uh, uh, very helpful as a technology for, for the, the field of life sciences, and it will still uh, remain very helpful in the years to come. My interest in, in uh, initially in CRISPR-Cas9 comes from my interest in understanding diseases at the fundamental level, and I belong to those scientists who are interested in, in really uh, molecular and cellular mechanisms uh, behind uh, the, the diseases. So a number of my colleagues are, are focused on cancer diseases, diseases affecting the heart, brain, or genetic diseases. And I belong to those people interested in infectious diseases, focusing mainly on bacteria. And this has been mostly the focus of my career over the last 25 years, so working on, on bacterial pathogens that can cause diseases in humans. 
we always hope when we do fundamental work on, on different types of, of cells and, and organisms, we always hope to identify pathways, genes and molecules uh, that allow to really understand uh, the functions of genes and understand all the, the molecular and cellular mechanisms of, of life. But we also do this research, always hoping that uh, maybe we would find an interesting mechanism that could be harnessed for novel therapies or novel technologies. And having worked on bacteria for a long time and I've been trained as well at the Pasteur Institute, always had this notion that it was very important to focus on, on basic science and this was the only way uh, to find interesting mechanism that could be harnessed in the, the case of, of bacterial diseases or to find new antibiotics that can kill bacteria, um, but also working with bacteria, uh, the possibility to always improve uh, genetic tools uh, thanks to, to the bacteria and viruses that have really been the sources of multiple enzymes that have been used in molecular biology and genetics over the last uh, decades. Now, having said this, I just also take the opportunity to say that in my laboratory, we don't work only on CRISPR-Cas9, we work on, on uh, RNA and protein regulatory mechanisms, uh, allowing to understand how bacteria survive and, and, and in their environment and how they can cause diseases always having in mind that it is critical to continue to work on, on bacterial infectious diseases since it is the leading cause of death in children and adolescents worldwide and the antibacterial resistance uh, poses still a major health threat and, and this has been a, a field of, of interest highlighted recently by the United uh, Nations. Now having said this, genetics is really uh, critical in laboratories uh, for understanding functions of genes and, and with regard to the, to the medical field, for example, to, to really uh, uh, find new targets for, for therapeutics and also other purposes. And I just would like to, to give you an idea of where CRISPR-Cas9 can be placed in, in the history of genetics towards gene editing. And surely I mentioned only uh, selected uh, uh, breakthroughs the 19th century has been uh, very critical for fundamental genetics to establish rules of genetics with Darwin on the origin of species, Mandel on the segregation of alleles, and Friedrich Michel who isolated the DNA in 1871. Then the mid uh, last century was critical to show that the DNA was a carrier of genetic information to also determine the structure of the bellelics of DNA and to also reveal the genetic code, and, and this was very exciting, uh, with the possibility to really uh, understand uh, the, the, the code and, and also the need to develop technologies that would allow to, to target genes and, and understand uh, their, their expression and, and functions. And this came really in, uh, starting in the, in the 60s and, and 70s with a number of scientists interested at the time in... Uh, in macrobiology, working with bacteria. I mean, at the time, these were the, the main organism that one could work with, uh, genetically speaking. And I would like to, to mention a, a quote from Jacques Monod, a French uh, macrobiologist working at the Pasteur Institute, um, which uh, actually uh, Jacques Monod, together with Francois Jacob and, and Wolf, uh, received the, the Nobel Prize in 1964 uh, regarding very interesting concepts of, of proteins with enzymatic uh, properties in bacteria, uh, the, the, the notion of, of genes organized as, uh, as uh, operons, uh, the notion of, uh, of, uh, of also uh, RNA molecules that could have regulatory functions, not only uh, being the intermediate between the DNA and proteins, but also having uh, regulatory function. And, uh, this research having been done in, in bacteria and, and also in, uh, in, uh, in trying to understand how bacteria defend themselves against viruses of bacteria, which in, the, in this case were called uh, lysogenic phages. I just want to mention this because this is exactly what CRISPR-Cas9 is about. It's an RNA and protein-mediated system in bacteria. Uh, it's all about uh, interactions between bacteria and phages. And this is just to show that uh, 45, 40 to 50 years later, you can take, uh, um, uh, how do you say, 
uh, interesting uh, uh, um, breakthroughs uh, that, that were uh, highlighted in, in the past and still dig into the, the details of, of uh, certain types of topics which may not sound that exciting or fashionable, but you can still find very interesting uh, points. And although Jacques Monod was very visionary, in 1970, he wrote a, a book entitled Chance and Necessity, where he was quoting modern molecular genetics offers us no means whatsoever for acting upon the ancestral heritage so as to improve it with new features to create a genetic superman. On the contrary, it revealed the vanity of any such hope the genome's macroscopic proportions today and probably forever rule out manipulation of this sort. So unfortunately, he died relatively at an early age, and, and I'm, I'm sure he would be very glad to see and to hear about CRISPR Cas9 that really is about exactly what he was studying. <laughs> Having said this, uh, I'd like to mention also Francois Jacob, who quoted, nature is a tinkerer, not an inventor. And, and actually, if you look at uh, what every cell and organism is doing, specifically bacteria, they are, they are just uh, doing bricolage. It's all about tinkering. And us scientists, we are just here to try to understand all the very, very uh, tricky <laughs> mechanisms which uh, bacteria and other organisms have evolved to just uh, do tinkering. And, and so I think that it's also a very interesting uh, quote. Having said this, uh, the basics for the genetic tools really were developed in the mid-70s uh, with the discovery of, uh, of a number of enzymes originating from bacteria, also from viruses, and also trying to understand how bacteria defend themselves against mobile genetic elements. And I can cite the restriction enzymes, uh, different enzymes that were allowing to recombine DNA, the ability to sequence DNA, the ability to amplify DNA. Uh, on this slide, you don't have mentioned uh, the, all those also RNA interference mechanisms uh, that have been developed as technologies uh, in the beginning of 2000s to really target gene expression. An interesting aspect of, of genetics and the ability to do really genetics in the precise manner is really the field of gene editing uh, with engineered nucleases, so engineered proteins that have the ability to to cleave DNA in a sequence uh, specific manner that were developed in the, in the 90s and with the zinc finger nucleases and later on with the talent nucleases in 2010. Uh, this type of engineered proteins come from research on mega nucleases and homing nucleases in eukaryotic systems. And uh, some um, uh, scientists having done really wonderful work thinking that uh, you could take different properties of, of nucleases and engineered those nucleases in a way that they will uh, contain a, a code to be able to recognize a certain uh, sequence of interest on the DNA. But the technology behind those, uh, those proteins made uh, this uh, gene editing maybe not as uh, um, a technology that could be really used uh, in a democratic fashion because the idea is that the manipulator has to always engineer a new protein with a certain code to recognize a certain sequence of DNA of interest and protein engineering is not always uh, that fast and, and easy uh, for, for biologists in the lab. So uh, these enzymes were very good to introduce changes but time consuming and, and difficult to use in a democratic fashion and this is really what uh, CRISPR-Cas9 brings uh, with its uh, programmability through uh, this uh, RNA uh, component. Uh, so in, in my lab, and, and surely I will mention that a number of scientists have worked on, on CRISPR-Cas, there is a very interesting history in this field of research. Uh, in my lab, this, this uh, interest in CRISPR-Cas9 came really from uh, the, the focus of my laboratory when I uh, started my independent career as a principal investigator, uh, the focus on working on, on specifically Streptococcus pyogenes, that is a, a human pathogen responsible of uh, a large number of diseases, uh, from mild infections to more severe infections. And here you can see uh, the cocci, so Streptococcus pyogenes as, as, a, as a shape uh, uh, cocci, so here they are colored in red for the purpose of the picture, and they are invading uh, human epithelial cells, pharyngeal cells, uh, colored in, in green for the purpose of, of the picture. We are interested in different types of mechanisms, always RNA and protein-based, uh, allowing to understand how bacterial pathogens can attack the human host, and to a certain extent how the human host can defend itself against bacterial uh, pathogens. 
so we focus on protein quality control, the class of small regulatory RNAs, and uh, other regulatory mechanisms that allow to understand how virulence factors and other factors are uh, produced in the bacteria and allowing the bacteria to react uh, very fast with their environment, uh, which uh, leads to, and I would like to refer to the talk of uh, Frances uh, this morning, that leads to a lot of evolution considering uh, the large uh, variety of the bacterial world with a uh, large variety of bacterial species, which have been also very important for the evolution of the CRISPR-Cas9 system and constant uh, battle of the bacteria uh, with uh, the viruses of bacteria, the phages, but with other uh, types of, of uh, environments, uh, specifically those encountered in, uh, in the human host, such, such as almost osmotic stress, pH changes, heat shock, and other types of uh, host immune uh, responses. So we are very much interested in everything that is uh, the dynamic of uh, regulation of gene expression in bacteria. Having said this, we, came interested in, uh, we became interested in the, in the family of, of uh, small RNAs, uh, a little bit more than, uh, than something like 15 years ago, uh, with a notion which uh, Jennifer Donna explained you earlier, uh, that is that RNA, uh, in addition to be the intermediate molecule between DNA and protein, and to be also as ribosomal RNA involved in, in uh, in translation or as uh, transfer RNA involved in translation. You have also these RNA molecules that have a regulatory functions, some of which can code for small peptides, some of which do not code for any peptide or any protein. And in the bacterial world, this uh, field of research is, is quite exciting. Uh, a large number of small regulatory RNAs have been identified, in mostly in the so-called gram-negative bacteria. And what was found is that they use uh, a multitude of types of mechanisms to affect gene expression by directly interacting with messenger RNA, uh, forming antisense uh, structures. And by this interaction with the, the messenger RNA uh, that can uh, code for proteins, they can either uh, enhance or or uh, inhibit uh, the, translation, the, the stability of the messenger RNA. And they can also interact with the messenger RNA to activate or inhibit uh, translation via different means. They can also interact directly with proteins to activate their function or sequester uh, them from, from their function. When we started to work on, on CRISPR and, and the small RNA, so, uh, there was a type of mechanism that uh, was not yet described in bacteria, uh, which will be small RNAs that can uh, activate the expression of another small RNA, so really through a direct interaction, and this is what CRISPR-Cas9 um, brought. And also the fact uh, that small RNAs can interact directly uh, with DNA and affect the fate of this DNA, and this is really what uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, biology brought in terms of, of new concept, uh, new dogma. And we were kind of interested in, in picking up, uh, 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 I, I would say, a unique bacterium, Streptococcus pyogenes, in having the chance to, uh, to really highlight new mechanisms. And I'm just going to, to give you a little bit the beginning of how we, we came to CRISPR-Cas9, and then I will go very fast. But in principle, uh, we were working in my lab on, on, some, on some small regulatory RNAs for which we found uh, a biological function in, uh, in influencing uh, the, the potential of the bacterium to cause diseases via uh, direct uh, regulation of, of, gene, of expression of genes coding for virulence factors. And a little bit more than uh, 10 years ago, we were interested in finding uh, new small regulatory RNAs in Streptococcus pyogenes and have an idea of, of the panel of these molecules that could have regulatory functions. So we, we uh, approached the, the problem by using uh, bioinformatics that allowed us to highlight a, a number of sequences on, on the genome of Streptococcus pyogenes that potentially could code for RNA molecules, which maybe could have interesting biological functions. And we focused on, on uh, a molecule uh, that uh, we called at the time uh, spRNA49 that was uh, renamed uh, tracer RNA. And what we found is that uh, this uh, RNA molecule was actually encoded uh, in the vicinity of uh, a gene uh, on the genome of Streptococcus pyogenes that was uh, already highlighted at the time 
as, as a gene encoding a CRISPR system related protein containing two nuclease domains from Streptococcus thermophilus. And this is really about this Cas9 protein that had different names uh, before uh, the nomenclature uh, was agreed on with, with uh, the terminology Cas9. Uh, but this is really about this protein that contains indeed two nuclease domains uh, to, to cleave uh, the DNA. Having said this, we were focusing mainly on, on tracer RNA uh, with an, uh, as an RNA molecule uh, being uh, expressed uh, uh, within uh, three forms and with a very interesting pattern of, of very abundant expression. And we were also interested in, in CRISPR surely um, because we wanted to show that in Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, CRISPR could have a, a role in, uh, in uh, limiting the acquisition of the viruses of bacteria uh, which in Streptococcus pyogenes can uh, carry genes encoding uh, factors that allow uh, bacteria to cause uh, severe forms of diseases. And indeed, we could show ultimately that uh, in this bacterium, CRISPR uh, can limit in a way the acquisition of genes uh, that are important for uh, the severe aspects of diseases caused by Streptococcus pyogenes through uh, limiting uh, the acquisition of, of these uh, uh, genomes of, of viruses. So in principle, we're also interested in CRISPRs, but we were in a way uh, working on this tracer RNA molecule and working on these CRISPR RNA molecules independently. Uh, until we, we came to the point that it was important to look at, at the interaction of, of those two, uh, two components. Uh, having said this, CRISPR really brought us to this, uh, to this uh, uh, another type of, of infection biology where the bacteria are not um, pathogens of, of the human host, uh, but the bacteria can be host themselves and they can be attacked by this mobile genetic element. So I mentioned the viruses, but you have also the plasmids uh, that are autonomous, uh, uh, small uh, genomes uh, that can bring to the bacteria uh, very interesting genes, allowing the bacteria to resist uh, the action of antibiotics, or allowing the bacteria to adapt better to the environment. And surely enough, the bacteria have evolved uh, defense uh, systems against uh, those mobile genetic elements. So here, for example, you have a phage infecting a bacterial cell, and those phages can enter, uh, in some of the, the classes of the phages, can enter so-called the, the lytic cycle, whereby uh, the, the genome of the phage uh, uh, can be injected into the bacterial cell. Uh, the invading DNA will replicate to form a fetch particle that will kill a bacterial cell and propagate to kill other bacterial cells. And here you have the case where uh, the phage can enter so-called lysogenic cycle. So in this case, they are called temperate phages, and their genomes can be inserted as prophages into the genome of the bacteria. So in this case, the viruses bring new, new traits, new genetic traits to the bacteria. But in either cases, or also when bacteria are attacked by plasmids or transposons that are mobile genetic elements, uh, they have defense systems that allow them to, to attack uh, those mobile genetic elements. So you have different types of defense systems, most of which are considered as innate immunity. So it's in reference to innate and adaptive immunity in uh, eukaryotic organisms. And for example, the, the restriction enzymes, so these enzymes that are uh, used to really cleave DNA and clone DNA, those restriction enzymes have been identified uh, through really understanding uh, defense mechanisms in bacteria against viruses, so using restriction modification uh, systems. So you have uh, other types of innate uh, immunity existing in bacteria, and CRISPR-Cas is really the first and only adaptive immune system existing, not only in bacteria, but also in archaea. It's adaptive because you have a first uh, recognition of the mobile genetic element, uh, uh, prior to attack of the mobile genetic element. Uh, so Jennifer already explained you that uh, the system is composed uh, genetically um, by uh, a CRISPR array uh, that is composed of, of short uh, sequences, uh, here uh, highlighted in black, that are identical to one another, that are called uh, repeats, so they are repeated in, uh, in the genome, and they, they are interspaced by so-called spacer sequences, that have as origins um, mobile genetic element uh, sequences. And this CRISPR array 
uh, contains a, a region upstream of, of the array that allows this array to be uh, transcribed into a long uh, RNA molecule. And in the vicinity of this CRISPR array, you have a, a series of genes that code for the protein components. So in principle, you have the proteins and uh, you have the, the CRISPR RNAs. And you have uh, uh, three steps in the, in the immune system, so special acquisition, expression of the RNAs and the proteins, and then interference, uh, whereby the system is able to really recognize a mobile genetic element and affect its maintenance. And so you have a first uh, recognition of, of the invading DNA uh, through CRISPR-associated proteins uh, that will recognize the invading DNA, cleave a portion of this invading DNA to insert it into uh, the CRISPR array at the level of the, of the leader sequence, uh, allowing to provide uh, a memory of, uh, of this first infection with uh, the mobile genetic element. So this is a series of, of memorized uh, infections. Uh, these spacer sequences. Then you have expression of the system uh, through uh, mainly here at this level, transcription of this CRISPR array into a long precursor CRISPR RNA molecule that will undergo maturation in the sense that this long molecule will, will be able to be cleaved and produce individual CRISPR RNAs uh, that can guide a complex of CRISPR associated proteins uh, to the cognate uh, genome of the virus. So this is by recognition through uh, the memorized mark on, on the CRISPR RNA and uh, base pairing with uh, the cognate sequence on the invading genome of, of the virus. And ultimately, one uh, CRISPR-associated protein of the complex will recognize this interaction and will be able to cleave uh, the DNA of, of, the, of the virus. And this will be uh, the, the, the end for the, for the possibility of, of, the, of the virus to, to replicate and to propagate and be maintained. Having said this, uh, there is a, a very interesting story in the, in the field of, of the CRISPR-Cas um, biology. Briefly, I just want to mention this because it's important that um, you, you realize that uh, uh, surely uh, there are always a lot of, of scientists uh, having been in, involved and, and bringing uh, different pieces in, in the puzzle. So 30 years ago, a, a Japanese group identified uh, this series of, of repeats in the genome of E. coli, but they didn't have any idea about the functions of, of those repeats. And then at the end 90s, beginning 2000s, uh, some scientists showed that actually this CRISPR array uh, could be produced into RNA molecules of different sizes. They did so-called northern blot analysis, and they found that actually this CRISPR array could be really uh, RNA molecules of different sizes. So they saw that there was... Uh, uh, obviously, also cleavage of RNAs involved and activation of RNAs. And then bioinformaticians in the beginning 2000s, mid 2000s, found out that actually uh, in the vicinity of, those, uh, of this series of repeats, you had genes encoding the CRISPR associated proteins uh, with uh, interesting features of proteins being very similar to proteins that have been identified. Um, uh, um, prior to, to the Cas proteins, proteins that, that can interact with DNA and RNA or cleave DNA and uh, RNA. And then what was also found is that in, uh, in uh, this uh, series of repeats were interspaced by sequences that seem to be uh, constantly matching uh, sequences of viruses, plasmids, and transposons. And so, uh, as, as Jennifer mentioned, the idea was that uh, the system could be an interference system existing in back-end archaea that will be RNA-mediated, composed of uh, RNA protein complexes, allowing really the back-end archaea to fight uh, the, the, the invasion of mobile genetic elements. And indeed, uh, so you have had, and actually I miss a lot of, 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 uh, of studies, but the group of, of uh, Orvarts and, and Moano with uh, Baongu who showed in 2017, and in 2007, uh, sorry, 2007, working on Streptococcus thermophilus that CRISPR-Cas was an adaptive immune system in bacteria. And then a number of colleagues showing, and this, uh, you already saw these slides, uh, the, the showing the, the, the evolution of the CRISPR-Cas systems in multiple types mainly through uh, different uh, composition and nature of the CRISPR-associated genes. So I have the group of, of uh, Marafini and Sandtimer and, and uh, Jean van der Oost and Stan Brands showing really that uh, the, actually the type one was Michael Turns and, and, and Stan Brands and, 
And uh, John Van Tao showing that actually the type 1 system could uh, target DNA, and then Marafini and Santama who showed that also the type 3 systems could also uh, target DNA using different types of mechanisms, but always one CRISPR RNA molecule and a complex of CRISPR associated proteins. So, surely I miss the implication of, of a number of scientists uh, since uh, the last uh, 10 years. But what is really pe peculiar with uh, the CRISPR Cas9 system is really its simplicity and the mechanism that was different from the mechanisms of the type 1 and type 3 system that were started to be studied when we uh, got interested in, in CRISPR-Cas systems. And CRISPR-Cas9 is unique because instead of a complex of proteins targeting the, the genomes, you have only one protein involved, Cas9, and instead of one uh, RNA molecule that contains uh, the memorized mark of the mobile genetic element, you have two RNA molecules. Uh, so the idea for me was really to, to ask whether trace RNA, which initially we thought that it was a regulatory RNA that was involved in the regulation of expression of a virulence factor, and we had found actually a very interesting target, but we could not make any sense of this interaction. And then the idea that I had was really that maybe trace RNA would have an, an active role in the CRISPR-Cas9 system, because at the time we didn't know anything about the regulation of, of the system. And also because when you work in the RNA field, you know that sometimes you have some RNA molecules encoded next to their target that can work in cis or in trans. And so this was the idea behind. And then we started really to decipher uh, the, the mechanism. Uh, so showing really that uh, the three components of the system very early on were really Cas9 and with stress to RNA. So this uh, duplex of RNA uh, stabilized with Cas9 with the first uh, uh, event that allows to really produce uh, the ultimate uh, mature CRISPR RNA that can guide a Cas9 protein to the, to the targeting genome. So we, we did not work only on, on Streptococcus uh, pyogenes, actually. Uh, very early on, we, we understood the diversity of this system in, in the bacterial world. And this is by looking at the evolution of the system that we understood really the rules of how the components could interact with one another. And we really looked at multiple uh, bacterial species and understood very early on that uh, the, the sequences encoding tracer RNA, the CRISPR RNA, and the Cas9 protein were extremely diverse when comparing different bacterial species. However, uh, by looking at this diversity, we could really understood the, the conservation of the system that was really a base pairing between tracer RNA and the CRISPR RNA and an interaction with uh, Cas9 proteins. So very fast we, we synthesized uh, the RNAs and the proteins uh, of, of different bacterial species, uh, knocked out all the domains important, etc., and ultimately uh, finding uh, what would be really the, the targeting mechanism that uh, surely was also on, on the DNA. So this is also something that we have shown that the RNA was not targeted but the, the DNA. So then, uh, um, Jennifer explained you a little bit the principles of how the system works. Uh, what is important to mention is that it's uh, really a, a unique uh, system, very flexible for the case of Streptococcus pyogenes. And this is where maybe uh, <laughs> we were very lucky to, <laughs> to work on this bacterium. Uh, as I said, this system exists in, uh, in a number of bacterial species, and, and we and others have tried to to adopt uh, the, uh, this mechanism, uh, not only on streptococcus, of streptococcus pyogenes, but originating from different bacterial species, to, to try to adopt this mechanism in, in the technology CRISPR-Cas9 to target uh, uh, DNA in any cell and, and organism. And it seems like the system from streptococcus pyogenes works particularly well, thanks to the flexibility of, of this uh, a protein that undergoes a, a specific conformational rearrangement each time that the protein uh, will first bind to the, to the RNA molecules and then uh, recognize uh, the DNA and then cleave the DNA. Something that, is, that I would like to mention, nevertheless, is that we always speak about a protein guided by two RNA molecules forming a duplex, and Jennifer explained uh, the idea to to really simplify the system by adding a linker that would allow to, to use a single guide RNA instead of, of two RNAs, which can be useful in certain types of application. Uh, there is a, a, another component that is important for the system to work, is a mark on the DNA that is called protospecial adjacent motif. 
It's a short stretch of, of letters of DNA, nucleotides, NGG, for the case of Streptococcus pyogenes. And this motif has to be present for Cas9 uh, system to, to work. And uh, the, the work of, of, of Silva Moano, who published a, a paper in Nature in 2010, was really critical uh, to, uh, came really to, to, to come really to the conclusion of this, of this uh, uh, motif being important for CRISPR-Cas9 system to cleave uh, DNA in a double-stranded, uh, by, by introducing double-stranded DNA breaks, except that at the time, uh, tracer RNA was not known, so the exact mechanism was not uh, really known. So when we, we really saw how the, the enzyme was working, and when ultimately uh, we really showed that, that uh, in a very simple manner, by just uh, exchanging a portion of this RNA molecule, one could really bring uh, this system to an RNA programmable technology, uh, it, it was clear as it was working so well in the test tube, very efficient enzyme from Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, that it could really offer considerable potential for genome editing in cells in the six kingdoms of life for biotechnological, biomedical, and gene therapeutic purposes. And indeed, as I said, uh, already six months, a little bit more than six months after we published uh, um, with Jennifer the, the, the paper in Science, a number of scientists showed, and these were publications from January to to March 2013, that the technology was working very well uh, in human cells uh, to perform genome editing and engineering in human cells, in mice, in bacteria, in plants, in model organisms that are um, really um, uh, studied in, uh, in the laboratory, and uh, also monkeys and also organoids, uh, with uh, a lot of efforts, uh, I would like to mention, from the scientific community early on, uh, from the Boston area, working on, on, on new cells with a groups of, of Fang Zhang and, and George Church. And, and very fast, actually, the entire world picked up on, on those uh, technologies to, to really uh, uh, see whether they could uh, uh, really uh, develop the technology for their own purposes to have a, a precise uh, genetic uh, tool uh, for genome engineering. So everyone agrees to say that the technology uh, offers a number of advantages, it's cheap and easy, it's very efficient, it's versatile, and it allows multiplexing in the sense that one can design different uh, programmable RNA molecules to target at once uh, different sequences on the genome. The, the system naturally is already highly specific and a number of uh, improvements have been done to bring the technology to even more specificity, so the idea that if you use the technology, and it's an important point for the applications of the technology, is that you would really like to, to modify a, a sequence of DNA of interest and, and not any other sequences on the genomes. The system has low toxicity and a lot of effort from the scientific community to really uh, uh, develop delivery systems that allow to bring the technology to the right cell and the right organism for different purposes. So you can correct... Uh, uh, mutations, you can delete portions of genes, you can add new sequences at the site of interest, you can replace a certain gene or a certain sequence by another sequence of interest, and as I said, uh, it's really uh, useful and working in, in any type of, of cells and organisms. These are just some aspects of the genetic toolbooks. What is really fascinating with this um, enzyme is that it has, uh, uh, by its nature, uh, domains that allow uh, really to cleave uh, the, the, the DNA, but you can mutate uh, easily those domains, and this was shown also by the group of, of Sixnis, and you can bring the, the enzyme that cleaves uh, DNA into RNA programmable uh, protein that can target DNA but not cleave DNA. And then you can fuse to this uh, RNA programmable uh, Cas9 different uh, domains that allow here, for example, to activate gene uh, expression or to inhibit gene expression. So you have a lot of screens that have been developed using this aspect of the technology. You can also fuse to the, to the Cas9 protein some effector domains that allow to modify uh, DNA and to study epigenetic phenomenon. You can also mark uh, the DNA, so you can really do um, different tricks. So it has large applications in human medicine, in synthetic biology, in agriculture for the production of new crops. And I would like to, to finish by really mentioning the aspect in human medicine. So it's, it has a, an indirect and, and direct uh, 
implication for an indirect application it's it's very useful to now be able to work with the right types type of human cells uh, uh, we were always a little bit restricted specifically uh, in my field of research infection biology in, in working with always the same type of of human cell, cell lines that are not always uh, the best uh, cells to work with depending on on, on the focus of of diseases we, we are interested in, uh, in, in studying. And here you can really target and, 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 and work with uh, more types of, of cells, uh, having the right technology that allows to understand functions of genes and unravel new pathways, also to engineer disease models, humanized disease models, uh, to, to understand better diseases. Uh, a lot of effort that have been uh, developed by the, 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 the community to really have these new types of screenings for targets for therapeutics to have new ways to validate new therapeutic targets and medicine on, and under development and a bed, bed to bench approach that is uh, with all the knowledge of, of sequences of genomes of, of patients and the idea of certain possible genetic uh, predisposition for certain diseases, the ability to go back to the bench and really test uh, the, the mutation that may be causative for diseases. And, and the big challenge that is really to develop the technology as direct therapeutics for the field of human gene therapy, which is uh, specifically a field of, of my interest. So what I want to say by this is that it's, it's, uh, it's a technology that is really helpful in the, in not only in basic science, but also in biotechnology and, and pharmaceutical industry. And in addition to, to human medicine, it really allows to study the diversity of, of the world. And it's really important to, to be able in the future to break certain dogmas or, or to, to bring to new, new breakthroughs in, in the knowledge of biology. So we continue working on, on different types of mechanisms uh, in my lab, focusing on, on, on infectious diseases, hoping that Chris Parkinson will be very helpful. Here, I just would like to finish by some acknowledgments. Um, indeed, uh, re research in our days is, is quite exciting, actually, because you have the possibility to, to really travel around the world, and, and this is important to, at least for me, it has been very important, so uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, research in particular developed in Austria, Sweden, and Germany, and, and prior to Austria, Sweden, and Germany, I was working in the US and, and France, and I really encourage you to, to travel, because you can really appreciate uh, different types of, of cultures, uh, cultures per se, but also cultures of approaching uh, science. Uh, you have the opportunity to meet great scientists. Sometimes you don't really realize that they may have uh, really, uh, um, how do you say, uh, affected uh, your life, and you realize after a while that uh, you knew that uh, they were inspiring you. But, but uh, so this aspect is, is very, very important. And also because in science, uh, you need a little bit to always find potentially new aspects of, 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 of topics and, and it's important as, as a challenge, as I think to move and it's always very challenging to, it's a challenging field in, in, in general, but specifically to, uh, to get to, to know different types of administration and funding organizations. So I would like to thank Austria and Germany, but specifically Sweden, because this idea to, to really focus on CRISPR and, and bring those two pathways, stressor RNA and CRISPR together, really came uh, in Sweden at the Laboratory for Molecular Infection Medicine, Sweden at Umeå University. Um, so uh, up north, uh, next to the polar circle. I would like to thank for sure wonderful team of, of scientists. I mean, without talented young researchers, nothing will happen. And I just would like to mention specifically Elitsa Delchefa, Christoph Chilinski and also others. It's always a very inspiring international environment with young, young uh, scientists bringing always new ideas and being always enthusiastic, so it's really refreshing. And my collaborators, the group of Jörg Vogel in Würzburg, Jennifer Donner, surely, with Martin Yinek and Eugenie Kunin for studying the evolution of the system. This is my lab when they were uh, summer students last summer. would like to mention ERS Genomics and CRISPR Therapeutics for conflict of interest, and, and some quotes are, um, one was lost, from Louis Pasteur. In the field, <laughs> which was uh, 150 years ago, in the field of observation, ch chance favors the pre prepared mind. Uh, this, I think it's very true. Uh, 
Let me tell you the secret that has led me to my goal. My strength lies solely in my tenacity, and I think this is important in science. Persistence in scientific research leads to what I call instinct of for truth, and this is also important, and surely the last one I cannot read. Um, I, I like also this one, and this is my last slide, it's from François Jacob. I say night science is because I was in Umeo and most of the time it's uh, dark, but I mean, there is another part of, of the time where it's uh, full light. And I, I think it's interesting, and again, it was uh, quoted uh, a number of years ago. Night science, a stumbling, wandering exploration of the natural world that relies on intuition as much as it does on the cold, orderly logic of day science. In two days, vastly expanded scientific enterprise, obsessed with impact factors and competition, we will need much more night science to unveil the many mysteries that remain about the workings of organisms. And at least for my part, Sweden has been great. You go to the north, no one cares about whether you're alive or not. <laughs> you can be quiet and you can focus and it's great. <laughs>